So welcome everyone. Welcome to Science Thursdays with Brookhaven Lab. The purpose of Science Thursday is to engage our student and education community in STEM topics by meeting CNL STEM professionals. Learn about more about their work and career path that got them to where they are today. At the end of the 45 minutes or so, we hope that you what we hope that what you have heard will spark your interest in, in a STEM career and perhaps even consider being part of the Brookhaven Lab community. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Aleida Perez from the Office of Educational Programs, and I'm joined by my colleague, Diana Murphy, who will be manage the Q&A portion of today's discussion. Um, before I introduce our, our special our guest today, a couple of few reminders. Uh, submit your questions uh, using the Q&A section. We will try to get at, to as many questions as we can today. And if you have any difficulties or with the video stream, you can let IT know by making a comment in the chat section and we'll do our very best to help. So today I am joined by Kayla Hernandez. She's an electrical engineer at the Brookhaven Collider Accelerator Department or CAD for short. Kayla is joining us to talk about her work as part of the radio frequency group and her career path, which is I, I which is as when she and I were talking about you know, getting ready for today's event is, is something that I think we all should, should listen to. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Kayla. How are you? Hi. Hi, Alina. Hi, Diana. Hi, everybody. I'm great. Thanks for having me. It is a pleasure. So before we get uh, going, you are long, uh, you are a native Long Islander, that's correct? That's correct. Born and raised. Born and raised. So we will get to that path because I think it's important that we hear about it. And you're from when Brentwood, right? Brentwood. Yes. Brentwood, Brentwood, born and raised. <laughs> so, um, so Kayla, uh, you are an electrical engineer in the radio frequency group here at Brookhaven Lab. There are many kinds and types of engineers. People think, you know, when they hear engineers, they think of oh, trains, right? Yeah. For, for our audience. What is an electrical engineer? So electrical engineering is actually a really broad field. There are electrical engineers in telecommunications who work on cell phone towers, kind of like what you think, what do you think of as like 5G? They talk to satellites up in space or to rockets about to launch. There is power engineering, control engineering, chip design, control engineering, the list goes on forever. But what we all have in common is that our work concerns manipulating electrons, which honestly sounds like magic, but for the most part, electrons are predictable. There are rules electrons like to follow. And if you know them, most of the time, you can get them to do what you want. So you say that it in, so, in, it, the, so it, the, the electron is what, the rules of the electron, the manipulation of the electron is what binds all this engineer together. That, am I hearing you correctly? That's it. That's what everyone is focused on. We maybe use different constants. We have different names for our variables, but it's all the same math. All the same math. Very cool. Very cool. That's a good way to put it. Actually, never think about it in that perspective. That's <laughs> a very good to put it. So you are an electrical engineer in the radio frequency group. You are a member of the radio frequency group. What is radio? What is RF or radio frequency? So I can show you guys some images um, to help me have this discussion. Okay. Okay. So, well, the first thing is, like you said, what is RF? Maybe some of you are familiar with analog signals. Analog signals are just traveling sine waves. They wiggle, right? They wiggle periodically. And how many times they complete a cycle per second is a unit called hertz. Something you'd be familiar with is like the 60 Hertz signal that you get from your wall outlet, the one that you like plug your laptop in to charge. When we're talking about radio frequency, RF, we're talking about signals from 20 kilohertz, 2000 Hertz to 300 billion Hertz or 300 gigahertz. And that's kind of a weird thing to think about. That's a, those are crazy numbers. What do those mean physically? Well, if you've taken any physics, you know that there's a relationship between frequency and wavelength. The higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength. A good rule of thumb is that 10 
gigahertz is three centimeters, like this big, and 100 kilohertz is like 3,000 meters. So vast physical distances or very, very short distances can be RF. Um, this is only important. I only bring this up because in my PowerPoint, you can see that this picture right here is of a 19 megahertz cavity from the 1960s. It's a, it's a big thing. Those are two like full grown humans standing next to it. And right here is a picture of Cliff Brutus, who's also a full grown human standing next to the 704 megahertz warm cavity. So 19 megahertz, 704 megahertz, there are vast difference in sizes. Now, you know, cavities don't all have to be this big at that frequency. We have nine megahertz cavities, which are smaller. And that kind of brings me to this side. Um, you can just see from here, like all the really cool shapes that cavities can come in. They're for all sorts of different purposes. This is just a one cell cavity. That one's called a crab cavity. That's a five cell cavity. But the most basic form of a cavity is a pillbox. Um, RF cavities are specially shaped structures. Physicists and engineers make them with a special geometry to resonate at a particular frequency. One of the simplest shapes is like the soda can, except you notice that there's a beam pipe going through it. When you drive a cavity, when you apply RF voltage, at right frequency, you can get really high voltage inside that cavity, like megavolts, like millions and millions of volts. AC wall outlets are 120 volts in comparison. Um, why do we care about resonance? What is resonance? Resonance is kind of like when you push someone on a swing. And you know that when you stand behind someone on a swing and you push them, you have to push them at just the right time to give them that energy to get them to go higher. When um, we like to say that you need to kick the beam. When beam passes through a cavity, you want to apply high voltage just as it passes through. So as this beam travels through the cavity, you want to kick it when it's right here. RF cavities are sort of like that. They're sort of like swings. They're sort of like um, tuning forks in the, same, in the same way. The beam gets kicked as it goes through sequential cavities though. So it's not just one cavity. More often than that, you have a series of cavities so that every time the beam passes through, it gets another kick. Um, but kicking the beam, isn't the only thing that RF does. So if you want to ask the next question, Alita, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So just so the kick, when you mean kicking, you mean uh, pushing that particle forward, correct? Yeah. So when you kick the beam, mm -hmm. it's jargon, but it's a good way to think about it. Um, when you are applying high voltage to the beam, you're giving it energy, just like when you kick a ball. Yeah. So, so it helps. It, it, one of the functions is to make sure that that particle goes fast enough, but it has yeah. to accelerate to a certain energy. So exactly. I know you. I know you have those images of RF cavities in the air. So uh, what is what is what is uh, what is now that we're talking about this kicking and the acceleration? Mm -hmm. So it would lead into what is the job of the air RF cavity in that context? Yes. So RF RF doesn't just like Aleda is alluding to, RF doesn't just accelerate the beam. It doesn't just kick beam. We also manipulate the beam through the cavities. We can change the shape of the beam. We can merge the beam bunches together or we can split them apart. And we can also line up different machines, different accelerators together like gears to transfer the beam from one machine into another machine. So here is our LINAC, it's our linear accelerator. We have to get beam from our LINAC into our booster. We have to kick that beam into our AGS, out of the AGS into a blue ring, and then out of AGS into a yellow ring so that these two beams can then be lined up by the RF and colli collided together at Phoenix or at Star. Um, so, you can imagine that trying to move beams between machines is really hard. It, it really is. Timing is of the utmost importance. Injecting beam with circulator accelerators is like driving two cars on two separate circular tracks. So you have two cars driving on two circular tracks. And when they meet up in the middle, 
you want to you want to throw a softball between those cars timing is very important like trillionths of a second can matter in these kinds of interactions and so the rf group has to be really multidisciplined the rf group has to be um really talented in order to get this to happen right so this is this is a cavity controller We've been talking about cavities and how they manipulate beam. Well, this is what that looks like. This is the equipment that will, manipul will manipulate the power, manipulate the voltage that is going to a cavity and make all that crazy stuff happen. Um, I won't go through the details of what this is unless you guys okay. ask me to, but that's what they look like. And so you mentioned that you are, so one thing that you and I were talking about when, when you're looking at the kicking that the, that the, in the RS group, there are, low and high, right? So what is the difference between those two? The, the, they, 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 they work together, but they have very specific jobs to that. Is that correct? Yes. yes. So um, the high power guys are ultimately where the power comes from. We have these big, heavy amplifiers. We have klystrons that are bigger than this room. They're enormous. And all of that really high power energy costs a lot of money. So PSEG kind of hates us. And it needs to be controlled really precisely. And that's where the low level RF comes in. We are control systems. That's why it's called an, an RF controller. And we very, very carefully manage the high power RF. So you, the, the low power RF basically, you know, accelerate that beam and the, 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 the high accelerate the beam and the low just making sure that the beam goes where it needs to go, right? Control. You know what accelerates the beam too. So the high power RF is like a, our, our puppet. And that's, that's not to, to say anything bad mm -hmm, about high mm -hmm. power. That's really dangerous, very important stuff. But we, we tell the amplifiers when to turn on, how high to turn on, okay. how to ramp, Correct. all sorts of things. That sounds very, actually very cool. You and I were talking before that, that uh, you, 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 part of your job is to be on call when needed to support the needs of this machine. Is that correct? So when it comes to the, the any when, it, when it, the RF breaks, there is Kayla right there. First line of defense, First not for of... high power. We have high power people mm -hmm. who handle those kinds of things. But if something's going wrong with the controls, they call me even if it's 3 a.m. on Easter and <laughs> gotta stop that's what just, I'm doing. <laughs> that's, just, that's, that's exciting. I, I think that's exciting. Now that, you know, I say that and then I'm not there doing it. Uh, uh, the job. It's not exciting way. the first time it happens. The first time <laughs> it happens is more panic than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> so how, so how is it that, how the RF group in general can or support the relativistic heavy ion collider? Okay, so we can go through this picture. Oh, right. One thing before you go there, how much energy does it take up? The, mm -hmm. So Every cavity has a different operating point. Every cavity has different operating power. Depends what you're trying to get done. So if you're trying to move, like if you're trying to just kick a deflecting cavity, trying to kick the beam in one direction into a, a diagnostic line, or if you're trying to accelerate, or if you're just a storage ring, right? If you're a storage ring, you're not trying to accelerate. You wanna keep the beam at the same energy. So you don't really need that much power. But if you're trying to accelerate, you need a lot of power. So, um, like it could be like four kilowatt amplifiers or like, you know, way more than that. Like, um, like 40 kilowatts, 50 kilowatts, lots and lots of power dissipation. Um, it's, it really depends on the application. So the, yeah, I was gonna say, the, the thing what you're trying to do, that much energy usage that would be required. There's a question in the, that just came up. It's like, what kind of experiments are the cavities used for? Ooh, mm -hmm. I love this question. <laughs> so. Um, there's lots of really cool experiments going on all the time. And so Rick is different. The collider accelerator experiment is different than um, an NS LS2 for this reason. We don't have users to say, right? So we, ex we um, our accelerators support places that do have users like NASA. NASA uses our beam from Booster. This is where NASA is. It's called the National radiation, it's NASA Space Radiation Laboratory. Um, right here is Booster. They get our beam, we scrape off beam and we send it to them and they irradiate different kinds of electronics to see what, hap what would happen if those electronics 
are exposed to cosmic rays in space. So that's one kind of thing that we do. They also irradiate like mice to see what, what happens to mice in space um, and like how they can make better shielding for their equipment, that kind of a thing. We also, um, there's also like experiments on how to make EIC work. We have like a, an experiment where we run electron beams next to a different kind of beam and see how they interact with each other, those kinds of things. We will talk a little bit about the electron ion collider uh, later on, but when you and I were talking, you mentioned that in the NASA Space Radiation Lab that they, the beam is not in bundles, right? That, that it's, it's actually, yeah. you mentioned something that in the way I can think of it, it's like a shape, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. Exactly. So for collisions, you want really nicely bunched beam, right? Collisions, you're, you're colliding these really, really, really tiny things. You need them to be close together so that you have a higher probability of two coming into contact with each other, right? That you want them to interact, you need tightly bunched beam or beam with low emittance. That's a weird way to say it. But beam in the collider, what does that even look like, right? It looks like a football, essentially, right? If you go over here, you can see like the envelope of a sine wave. If you, if you flip this upside down, it would look kind of like that, right? And so the beam lives in here, that's called an RF bucket. So we keep football sized beam in a bucket. NSRL is different. They don't want tightly bunched beam. Cosmic rays are everywhere, right? So what we do is instead of putting this beam where it's gonna be bunched in the AGS or um, where it'll be better focused in the AGS, we directly send it to NSRL through like a tunnel, like a septum. Like you have to think like your nose is like a septum. And as it goes into that septum, it's like we're peeling it off like an apple. Like you're peeling the beam out layer after layer. Layer, yeah. It's really weird. <laughs> sounds actually very cool, but very, sounds, sounds very, it's a different way to use this, you know, this, this, uh, this application it's a, an application that have multiple uses, multiple ways to use utilize it. So going back to uh, the the question that we were talking about before, um, you know, we we uh, answered some of the questions from the audience is that. So how is it that your group support RIC? In what way RIC is uh, your group support RIC? Okay, so RIC. Okay, so uh, first, idea, I can collide. first we'll start at the beginning. So RIC is a collider right? It's two storage rings. And ultimately, you overlay the beams together in our interaction regions at Phoenix and at Star for collisions. That's the end goal. But first, you need beam. Where does that begin? It begins places like at EBIS and at LINAC. So you have, we have to hit a laser, use a laser to hit a puck sometimes. That's sometimes how it goes. There's something that excites tiny particles off of a surface, they get accelerated by our RF cavities. Our RF cavities are right in front of the gun, right? That's what we call it sometimes. Um, and they accelerate those particles coming off that puck. And then they get them to go super fast in booster. And then in AGS, we go even faster. We get tighter beam, better for collisions. And then we inject that into the yellow ring and we inject that into the blue ring so that it can be collided for the relativistic heavy ion collider experiments. So what RF, RF, how RF um, supports RIC is by helping manipulate its beam, preparing the beam for collisions. Because for collisions, you need really, really high energy. So you need to get your beam going like almost the speed of light. And we put the accelerate and the collider accelerator. <laughs> As I was going to ask this question, how fast, <laughs> as close at the speed of light. They're very, it's a, it's a very, it's, it's, it's actually very exciting. And now that we are moving into the electron ion collider, which is our next big, big project that we have planned, um, how is it that their, your team, their, their uh, radio frequency group is supporting those efforts? Okay, that's a good point. So, um, I'll move to this slide. First of all, if you can say a little bit, you know, we're going to talk about, go ahead. About what EIC is. Yes. Maybe I will start there. Um, so we talked about Rick a bit. 
We talked about how we, we smashed together hadrons, where we smashed together protons. We'll say that. Uh, different, different elements from the periodic table, like gold, or we did an oxygen run recently. And that's kind of what this looks like. You see all the pieces that are flying off? That's what, that's what the, that collision looks like. So EIC is for smashing electrons, this piece, right? This, these guys over here, it's for smashing electrons into protons, this piece, at very high energy in order to study the structure of a proton. So what we're trying to figure out is what does, what does that even look like on the inside of a proton? And we have to do that at very high energy to see some of the cooler stuff. So if you're familiar with the Bohr model, which should be, um, you have a nucleus right here and your electrons living happily in their little orbitals. For a long time, we thought that all of the things in the nucleus, all of, the, all of these particles, all these components were fundamental particles that they couldn't be broken apart, right? Just like we thought the atom couldn't be broken apart. But what we learned is that there's, there's like a world of stuff going on inside the, par the components of the nucleus. Um, so an electron is fundamental. There's nothing going on inside of an electron. It's just an electron. So it can be used as a probe to figure out what's going on inside the protons much better than colliding two protons together. Um, the, detector, the detector picture is, looks like this. The electron's gonna blow the proton into the smithereens and then the pieces will spray out. And then the physicists are gonna try to put those pieces back together. That's the puzzle they're trying to solve. So, uh, in so in what way your I know that you so in what way the RF team then will support oh. that project? Great. Okay. So all the infrastructure that already exists for Rick, this is why our site was really selected, right? Because it was a big competition. They picked us because we had the most infrastructure already in place. Right. And there was a lot of other reasons too. I should not, um, you know, minimize that effort. It was huge. But one of the reasons was that we have so much already here. So this is a picture of the EIC. And you can see that we have still our LINAC, still our booster, still the AGS, still our hadron ring, right? This yellow ion ring. The new things that are coming in are gonna be the electron storage ring. And there's gonna be the, um, the electron injector synchrotron, which is really just a cool way of saying, that's how we're going to get the electrons into the electron storage ring, because first you have to get them at high energies, right? So my group is going to support all of the RF cavities that are going to be needed to accelerate electrons. And we're gonna support, continue to so support and upgrade our existing systems so that they can be used for the next 20 years or so. This is a cool cross section. So you can see kind of where it lays out in the tunnel. This is like the yellow ring, that's like the blue ring. This is going to be the electronics um, injector synchrotron, and this is going to be the electron storage ring. Sounds like a very cool engineering, new, mm -hmm. you know, an opportunity to perhaps come up with new ways as well as this, as the machine gets put together. Electrons, so. yeah, there's so much going on down there. It's it's amazing, like how many people have to come together to make this thing happen. You talk about unity. I mean, it's it's beautiful how many people are working on these projects. I kind of I have a really cool animation I can show you guys. This is what it looks like for Rick, right? So we have our, our particles going around our little circle. And then they go into yellow. Then they go into blue and they circulate for a little while and collide. So that's what's going on right now. These are our collisions. Every time the beam crosses, it's an interaction region. The thing that's changing is we're gonna build a new blue ring for the electrons to live in. That's where they're gonna collide. And this red ring is the, um, what I mentioned before, the electron injector synchrotron. Ooh, and this purple one is cool. That's how we're gonna, we're gonna um, it's another way of focusing the beam. It's, it's a way to cool electron beam to make it more compact. Make it smaller, yeah. I, that, there's a question on the chat. It's asking, like, I guess, how how long, how often these collisions happen? Oh. How mm -hmm. how long does it take for these particles to collide? So, we run the collider six months of the year, 
And when we are running physics, collisions are happening pretty much all the time. They're happening very often in any given store. We call it a store. And it's usually like a 12 hour period for collisions for data to be taken. And then, we, then we'll stop, they'll change something, like they'll move to a different energy. They want to use a different kind of beam and then we'll do it again. And then they fill the rings again. That's another question related to what we were just talking about. And how do electron collisions differ from hadron collisions? Okay, good question. So we're gonna go back to this slide. So when you're, chem when you're colliding a proton with a proton or a hadron with a proton, what you're doing, it's like a car crash, right? That's, a, that's the, our favorite analogy for this. When you crash two cars together and you try to figure out what those two cars individually, it was this a Toyota, was this like a Chevy from the collision? It's hard because there's so many pieces, right? When you collide those things together, the pieces that come out are from both particles, right? But if you use an electron, the electron lives happy in its orbital, right? It doesn't really, it doesn't care about the strong force that holds all these particles together. So it's a great probe, it's fundamental. It's not gonna break apart. All of the pieces that come out of those collisions will ultimately be from the hadron or from the proton. The, elect, the way that the electron bounces off will tell you a little bit about the collision too, but all this junk that sprays out, one car only, not two cars. That's the benefit. So it's small enough that you will not see it. You will not see it out of the result of the collision, right? You mm -hmm. only see the big car out of it. That's what I'm, for better than analogy. Well, there's no that parts, right? There, there's the no electron, the electron isn't made of quarks and the gluons that hold it together, right? Protons are made of quarks and the gluons that hold them together. The electrons are fundamental. They're not made up of those things. Those things won't come from it in the collision. That's my like basic that. understanding. I am not a physicist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like it. I like that. I, I, I like that, that, that analogy. Um, so feel free to put questions on the Q&A uh, portion of it. We will try to get as many as we can. Um, so I would like to sh shift to your path a little bit. And, and so I'm sure that people will, will, will if there are any other science, or any questions related to the, to the work that you do, we'll, we'll squeeze them in as, as we see it needed. So, oh, that's a cool one. Can I talk <laughs> about that one? This is my path. This is, um, so I, I was a tech. So let's start, tech. yep. So, <laughs> There's a whole bunch of students watching today. I know the Brentwood family is here. Uh, and so who are, would like to, to, to learn about how do you get to where you are now? Um, I know you started a BNL in a very interesting path as an as a engineering technician. And then you're in, and that was the beginning of your path here at BNL. Uh, we were part of that journey. So tell us a little bit more about that. So you're right, and in truth, I haven't been an engineer very long. It's been like eight months. I've been at the lab for four years though, and a bulk of my experience is as a technician. So as a tech, you it's, a, it's different. The difference is you don't really design things. So I would mark up schematics and build printed circuit boards, like the, the kinds that I showed you earlier. I would test them, and then I would build the house that they live in, the chassis that's like right here right? And now as an engineer, I got to train m my replacement, this wonderful human, his name is John Netto. And now he gets to, to build the chassis that I design and build the printed circuit boards that I make. Um, I, I kind of, this is my last slide, so I'll stop sharing. But I'll say that I always knew I wanted to be in STEM. When I was in middle school, I finished all of my projects way before they were due. I was that kind of a nerd. And when I was in high school, I competed in science Olympiads. I took research and principles of engineering. My home life was kind of hard. So the science community within my school was like my family. It's where I felt most like myself. It gave me a place to be after school, but more importantly, it kept me and all of the people I cared about on the edge of what we know. It, what we were like, you know, identifying rocks and 
throwing eggs down the stairwell and building robot arms. And it was then where I really realized that that's kind of the edge of what I know was where I wanted to be for the rest of my life. Um, so first I wanted to be an environmental engineer. So I was gonna build wells in the Peace Corps, but plan A doesn't always work out. Right. And I had to transfer from Stony Brook to Suffolk because it was hard to get there. And I wasn't really getting what I wanted to out of my coursework. I was like biking like 40 plus hours a week. It was crazy. And by the time I got to my 4 p.m. environmental science class, I was falling asleep. My professor would throw things at me, like pieces of paper to wake me up in the middle of class. It was, wow. uh, it was hard to admit that I couldn't keep up with like the normal kids who were dorming or driving. And so I had to adjust. I started taking classes at Suffolk. And there, there was hope that I'd get scholarship and I could go away elsewhere or that my associates would help me get a better job so I could afford car insurance. Um, I was, it was there that I met Bob Lambiers, who was my circuits professor. And he took a chance on me and he notified me of an internship opportunity at the lab. And the lab, my group, took me on with zero experience. Um, I did not know the difference between a flathead and a Phillips head screwdriver. And they really encouraged me, um, raised me up. And here, the um, lab pays for my tuition. So I was able to finish Stony Brook, my electrical engineering degree, part-time. It took me a total of six years to finish my bachelor's degree. But even though it's not what I envisioned when I was in high school, where I actually ended up graduating early so I could finish college sooner, I, I can't complain because things worked out in the end. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a different, everybody has a travel path, I will say, as, you know, and the path of study is a straightforward path, a little bit of convoluted from time to time, but, uh, but you make it to, you know, you, you, yeah. you make, you find and, and find a way to, to, to reach the goal, which you want to be an engineer. And it's something that I think is important for all of us to hear. So you were in first employee here as a technician, and then that supported you, allow, allows, provided that it's the space and the environment for you to continue your engineering degree. Yes. And finish. You're continuing studies, right? You're doing, you're still, you're pursuing your master's now. Is that correct? Yes, I am a grad student at Purdue and I'm getting my master's in electrical and computer engineering. And I was Excellent. thinking maybe with a focus in lasers. Very cool. So, and when in the timeline for you're hoping to be done, it does a, a two year program that you have? Uh, it will take me into oblivion to finish this. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's gonna, I'll be, I'll be like 29. So it's gonna be five years because I can only uh, really take one class at a time. I am yeah, on, yeah. right? So yes. 3 a.m. I gotta be here. <laughs> that is true. That is true. But I, I, I think it's, I think it's wonderful. And I think I, I like, like you and I were spoke in you know, a speaking uh, when we first talking about this, things do work out at the end in one way or another. Um, for students that are listening here, um, what kind of preparation uh, you say that a high school student or even a college student needs to think about before, you know, when you're thinking about engineering or even applying for a position like yours? Okay, so right now my group actually has two positions open for high school students. So to be a technician, you don't necessarily need an associate's degree, but it does give you a, a great leg up. So you can get an associate's degree from Suffolk or from NASA in electrical engineering technology, or you can get a bachelor's degree from Farmingdale in electrical engineering technology. And I wanna just stress that you wanna come out of those programs having learned some of the fundamentals. You don't need to be a genius, but you have to have the tools that you can build on once you get here. If you want to be an electrical engineer at the laboratory, don't stress out if you haven't taken all the math in high school. I want to let you know you could do that later. You could just you could focus on that while you while you're in college. I mean, if you can get it done in high school, do it. It's great. But don't let that stop you. Don't let math be the thing that keeps you out of STEM because it's not as scary as it seems. I, I promise. If you're gonna be an engineer, you're gonna to have to do lots of math. Calc one, two, three, four. And then they have this crazy thing, advanced math. And it's very important. 
if you're going to do that, you need a bachelor's degree in either engineering or in science. And then you're going to need to want to pursue a master's degree in something like um, embedded systems or PLC, digital signal processing or electromagnetics. Because we really don't hire a lot of entry level engineers. They kind of want you to have that specialized knowledge um, or you can you can intern. Internships are a, a good exposure to the field. There's the, the Haskell Research Program and there is the DOE Science on the Graduate Laboratory Internship, which are excellent ways to get into those into the field and explore and see what is it about? What is it about? Um, there is a question that I would like to ask now, based on your, came in the chat, based on your experience, what would you change to make STEM more inclusive? Mm. That's what is that three part question or accessible for people to participate. What is your thought on barriers? There you go that asking the hard hitting questions like I was worried you were going to ask me about LHC. <laughs> but, um, so this is great. I do I do a lot of outreach and I try to really tackle that problem head on. Um, so I have an intern. I have a student and she goes to Stony Brook. She's from the EOP program. And you just, you gotta like, sometimes it's just about individually bringing people up with you. You gotta do that. You gotta look behind you and say, who's not coming up with me? And you gotta, you gotta drag them over here. You gotta go to, I go to high schools. I haven't been to Brentwood yet, I hope to, but we go to local high schools and we do STEM. So we are the representation so that kids can see that this is a possibility and they know what routes to take. Um, I think like from a larger perspective, um, it's hard to bus kids here. I think that's one of the, the harder problems, like getting, getting schools to the lab can be difficult. And I really hope that this platform, this Zoom thing is gonna help bridge that gap in the future. But then you're relying on things like people having internet. It's an ongoing thing. I think you just gotta like uh, take the baton when it's handed to you and chip away at it one piece at a time. Yeah, and, 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 and I think it's, I, I think also uh, I will think about it and also um, having supporters, right? People who support, uh, support you, support uh, students and, and, and are advocates in, in that way. You know, our office yeah. does a lot of outreach with our community, including Brimwood and, and to continue uh, to do that with other schools this is very important. And I think individually students and finding advocates and in, in saying and seeing uh, having the students see themselves in our faces as a possibility is actually also another way to, to, to absolutely encourage exactly. and, and break those barriers as well. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's in, but and as you mentioned internship, I just like to also add that not you don't have to be at a four year school to do these internships, right? You can be at a community college. And, and participate in a Department of Energy internship that allows you to, to gain that experience in those um, and that fair exposure to, to yeah. the field. Mm -hmm. I think I think it's important. So I know you 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 are very active in the laboratory. You are very active on the lab uh, community. Um, what uh, you're you're a president of Brookhaven Women in Science, which is BWIS. Uh, what, why, why is it that, what, what, what is BWIS and what is it important, uh, what it has been very important for you to be involved in a group like BWIS? BWIS is a long established nonprofit. Um, it's a 501c3 that supports women in STEM. Not just scientists though, it's engineers, technicians, auditors, writers, really any woman who supports STEM, who works to support STEM. Um, we're very BNL adjacent. So BWIS provides workshops and professional development. We organize two awards for postdocs. We participate, like Aleda said, in community outreach, and we volunteer at public facing events. Um, so when I started my job, it was an adjustment. I had been from Brentwood where we're very diverse and my boss and all of the people around me just you know, really weren't. The next youngest person in my group was, I think, 20 years older than me. My boss was 30 years older than me, and it was daunting. There was definitely growing pains on all sides. 
And BWIS was a really big outlet for me. All of the employee resource groups were. Um, it gave me the opportunity to talk to other women in STEM. It's where I met one of my, my, my best advocates, my mentor, Lorelai. And it kind of helped me realize that if you want a seat at the table, you have to pull up a chair. So it's, you know, building the community. So BWIS has been a community for you. Oh, and yeah. You're... Look at my mug. <laughs> my Scientista mug. Because BWIS actually um, got to send, send me to a workshop in Boston for uh, women in STEM. It was wonderful. Yeah, the importance of like, yeah, building community. Again, it's making sure that you, you find a community that you're part, that, you, that, you are, that supports you and that makes you be part of the, of the, of, of the yeah. place that you are. There's a question that came out of the chat. Can you speak to the importance of finding your passion and pursuing that for your career and research? Absolutely. So fulfillment is going to look different for everybody. And everyone's um, path, like Aleda has said, is wobbly. No one's path is linear. And so when you do an internship, when you are participating hands-on early on, you can really um, expose yourself to people who are in the field and different aspects of the field so that you can put yourself in situations where you um, learn more about who you are, learn more about what you want, about the lifestyle that you're kind of trying to look for and balance that with the science that you wanna do and balance that with your career. Uh, finding something that you are happy about that makes your work fun, that, it, that you're excited to do every day is such a big part of fulfillment, but it, I don't want you to say that it's the only part of your fulfillment. If you can find work that you're passionate in and do it, it does make work a lot better though. That is very true. Yeah. Very, very true. <laughs> it makes but everything it, else worth it. It, 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 it worth it. Yes. Exactly. It makes every, it worth, everything worthwhile. By the way, that question came from Dr. Grella. Um, so that. now that we're talking about um, uh, shifting, so, I mentioned Dr. Grella on that. You have had mentors throughout your career, through your life. So when you and I were talking, you mentioned the importance of how important the, this mentors, the teachers that have supported you through the through your STEM path. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely, absolutely. So I I will start with Grella. I will start with Grella. So being in the high school research um, class and and working with Grella and with Giannakos and with Fritz and all the people from Sioli was instrumental. Um, they spoke to me like they knew I could be something important when I grew up and it helped me envision myself that way. It helped, it helped me see myself in the world as something bigger than I had previously been able to ima imagine myself. So I, I owe so much to, to Brentwood and to Grella and to Sioli. I think I love you all from the bottom of my heart. And I also really lucked out in my group. Like you find mentors all over the place. Um, my my low level RF group has brilliant people like Freddie Severino and Kevin Mernick who will walk me through why Booster is broken at 7 p.m. on a Sunday or explain changes they are making to accommodate a new beam species at 2 a.m. on Wednesday. Tom Hayes and Kevin Smith, who helped me uh, with my presentation slides, thank you, Kevin, have also made themselves available for me to ask long, long list of questions, which you should always feel comfortable doing. Please always ask questions. And again, I mentioned Lorelai Smart earlier. She's been an amazing woman and she's a completely dedicated engineer who sh and she keeps me grounded. I wanted to say that you don't need to worry about finding a mentor who fulfills all of your professional needs. Sometimes you luck out and someone will take you under their wing and some mentorships happen organically, but more often than not, you're gonna to need to seek people out and you'll find mentors and people you would, you would not expect. My student is a psychology major. So it, it doesn't, it can be cross-discipline that you, that you get these skills from. It takes a village, right? So find one person to talk about one goal, another person to help you navigate some other decision. And every step that you take, remember to turn around and help the people behind you because they're gonna need you to pull them up just like you needed help too. That's just exciting. 
wonderful. It's, it's then to forget that there was some, some there's somebody always behind us pushing us forward. So we are 4:45. Before we go, can you tell us two last advice for our audience? Two okay. important things that if they not didn't get anything else today, this is the two things that they will take with them. Okay. Don't measure yourself against anyone other than who you were last week. It's easy to get distracted by the success of your peers. No one is starting with the same set of circumstances though. Everyone's path to fulfillment is gonna look different. And like Alita said, they're not linear. As long as you are at the edge of what you know, you're in the right space. Um, don't underestimate yourself. Don't neglect your potential. If in the pursuit of your dreams, you find yourself in a situation that's uncomfortable, that's okay. The person on the other side of that discomfort is gonna be way more interesting than the person before it. And it means that you can fail, adjust and keep going. That's just wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's all we have for today. Kayla, I, I truly appreciate of you being our guest today. I think your, your, your advice and your words has a lot of wisdom. And I, and I know they will have a lot of impact in our students that are listening today. Um, at the end, you know, there is there's, there's some struggle, but at the end, there's a light at the end of it. I think it's just a very powerful story to tell. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, then our next Science Thursday is May 20, 2021, same time. And our guest will be James Bianca Rosa from the National Synchrotron Light Source. We'd like to thank Brookhaven National Laboratory for hosting this event today, today and encourage you to check our programs, um, check our programs, research, and industry opportunities, as well as available virtual content on our website, www.bnl.gov forward slash education. Thank you so much. Stay safe, wear your mask. See you next time.